Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you happen to be watching this. Really glad to have you here with us as we go through the last few books of the Bible here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Sunday School. Today we'll be going through the book of Jude. Next week we'll be finishing with the book of Revelation. And then in the fall, uh, I hope that we'll be able to start regular classes where people can come back in, we can joke with one another, we can have a great time studying the text together, and I'm not in a room uh, by myself where there's great and wonderful uh, times of, of fellowship. So today we want to look at one of my favorite books of the New Testament, the book of Jude. And you might wonder, that's an unusual book to say it's your favorite book of the New Testament, and it's one of my favorites, but Part of it is because it's such a weird book. It's a very strange little book, and I'm a very strange little person, so I happen to really like the book. So let's first of all look at the uh, cartoon that we look at every week. This theme of the book of Jude is that you must earnestly contend for the faith. That is, you must fight for the faith. So here we have a guy fighting. He's uh, doing judo, so that reminds us of Jude, and it, it brings to mind this, this contest. He's giving everything that he has because of the fact that he's engaged in a fight for the faith. And the key word is be careful about spiritual enemies. The key theme is be careful about spiritual enemies. Jude, who is the brother of James and apparently the brother of Jesus, is urging his readers to fight for the faith. And his language is reminiscent of, of, of uh, Matthew 23. And in Matthew 23, Jude condemns the outsider. In, in Matthew 23, just like in Jude, the outsiders are condemned as heretics set on dividing the church. It's not that we should look at outsiders as our enemies. No, but what Jude warns us about, the people whom we ought to look at as our enemies are those who are trying to infiltrate their way into the church and create problems and divide it. Certainly the church ought to welcome in everyone who wants to come in, but we cannot simply allow people to come in and create problems and create issues without realizing that that's damaging to the church. And that's what the book of Jude is about. The believer's response is to build ourselves up, not through our own strength, but through the strength of Jesus Christ. And without judging, we want to be reaching out to those who are having a hard time. We want to help those who are caught up in heresy and don't know any better, but we also want to warn those who are propagating that heresy that that will not be allowed in the church. So let's look at the book together and see some big picture things that we can look at. First question we have to ask is who wrote the book? And of course that leads us to the first question, who was Jude? The book of Jude was written by a person named Jude, or in the Greek, Judas. It's generally translated Jude so that there's not confusion with the Judas who betrayed Christ. But there's also the question of who wrote the book, even if it was a person named Jude, because Jude was not an unfamiliar name. So here's the text from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, a brother of James, to those who were called wrapped in the love of God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the interesting things in this passage is that the word from, from Jude, is not there. So in the Greek, it, it simply says Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. We mentioned this, I believe, when we looked at the book of James, but realize what Jude is saying here. He could if he is the, the brother of the James whom we are familiar with, and all indications is that that's who he, or most indications is that's who this Jude is, he doesn't tell us anything about himself. He assumes that we will know it. He could have said, Jude, a brother of Jesus, or a half-brother of Jesus, if you want to put it like that. He could have said that, but he didn't. He says, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, rather than saying, Jude, a brother of Jesus Christ. And that 
points us toward a, 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 a significant thing. And the significant thing is that it's almost more of a privilege to be a slave of Christ than it is to be the brother of Christ. Jude is making a point there, I think, in the way that he begins this book. So the Jude, most people think that the Jude that is writing this book is the Jude who was a uh, member of Jesus' family. Whether he was his brother or his cousin, depends upon whom you ask, depends upon what you think about the virginity of Mary. Uh, the, the text is not absolutely clear. The word that's used for brother can also mean close relative. So we, we don't know for absolutely certain that Mary had other children. There, there are a variety of different kinds of uh, beliefs on that. But we do know that these were people who were close to the historical Jesus. They were close, and they knew who Jesus was. So after we decide on who wrote the book, then, of course, we have to decide on when the book was written, what was the date. And, of course, a lot of this depends upon who wrote it. And if Jude wrote it, then it was written before the end of the first century. And we also have to decide about how one sees the book relationship with Second Peter. Remember that when we talked about 2 Peter, we talked about the fact that Jude and parts of 2 Peter are very, very similar, sometimes word for word. And there are three options as to what could have happened there. A, Peter could have used Jude as a source. So Peter could have been writing, said, I like the way that Jude phrased that. I'm going to put that in my book. We cannot expect ancient texts to use modern concepts like plagiarism. We can't expect Jude to footnote things in Turabian format. It just doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so it could be that Peter used Jude. The second alternative is that it could be that Jude used Peter. Jude heard about this letter, read it, and said, there are things that reminds me of things that I want to write, and I like the phrasing there. And on the, the third alternative is that Rather than Peter using Jude or Jude using Peter, it could be that they both used a third source with which we are unfamiliar. You know, of course, that many of the sources that existed during the period of <clears throat> Second Temple Judaism and even a little after the, the fall of Jerusalem, we don't have them. Uh, they, they were just destroyed. Uh, realize that we, we live in a world where it seems impossible for a a printed book to be destroyed because there's always going to be some other copy somewhere. But early on, when books were published in very small quantities, uh, that it, it, there are books that exist in the world today that there are only two or three copies around, and they're, <clears throat> they're very valuable for that reason. And in Second Temple Judaism, there wasn't any printing press. As a result, these books were hand-copied. So if, the, if it was not a hugely popular book, if it was not a book that had been translated or that had been copied and put out in a variety of places, it may have been destroyed. That could be what's going on here. It may be that Jude and Second Peter are using the same third source that we don't know anything about. <clears throat> one of the problems as you read through Jude and one of the criti critical issues in Jude is Jude used of extra canonical sources or non canonical sources. By that we mean Jude uses sources that are not contained in the Bible. And we'll look at a couple of those. The problem is this Jude uses at least two specific that we know of for certain non canonical sources in his book. The first one is the book of Enoch. You've heard of the book of Enoch, probably, if you've ever listened to people talk about the Bible and UFOs, often the book of Enoch comes up because there are all kinds of very strange things that happen in the book of Enoch. A lot of the book of Enoch has to do with giants that comes from Genesis 6, 
and when the sons of God looked down on the daughters of men and, <clears throat> and took them for wives. And the, this is a, a, a sort of explained and, and, and expanded in the book of Enoch. Now, this is what Jude says in verse 14. Now, Enoch, the seventh in descent, beginning with Adam, even prophesied of them, saying. And so he goes on to point out what it is that Enoch said there. So that's the first non-canonical source. Obviously, Enoch is not a book of the, of the Hebrew Bible. It's not a book of the Christian New Testament. It's not even an apocryphal book that is, uh, has been deemed canonical by the Roman Catholic Church. It's, it's none of those. It's a book that existed during this time, but it was not considered a part of the Bible. Then there's a second non-canonical source. The second non-canonical source is a book called The Assumption of Moses. We don't have a copy of this book. This is one of those books that simply has vanished to time, but we have quotations of it, fragments of it in other people's writings. And this is the story that is in Jude 9, but even when Michael the archangel was arguing with the devil and debating with him concerning Moses' body, he did not dare to bring a slanderous judgment, but said, may the Lord rebuke you. Uh, obviously, none of us remember that particular story from the Bible. We, we remember that Moses had to stay outside of the promised land. We remember that God buried Moses but we do not in any sense remember the story of, of a fight over the body of Moses between an archangel and the evil one. This comes from a book called The Assumption of Moses, and <clears throat> it's a non-canonical book, and yet Jude here uses it and seems to be saying that such a, uh, a fight did happen. So what are we to think about? in terms of the, this use of non-canonical sources by this man Jude. What's the answer to this kind of a problem? Well, <clears throat> there are three options, again, that we can sort of divide things into. One option is that Jude may have seen these books as being canonical. That is that Jude may, that there wasn't any sense in which there was an absolute list of canonical books at this point because there were books still being written. So some have argued that Jude saw these books, both the Assumption of Moses and the Book of Enoch, as being canonical. A second option is that Jude may be doing nothing more than citing a popular tradition or story. That is, that Enoch was a popular book that people knew about. The Assumption of Moses was a popular story that people knew about. As a result of that, what Jude is doing is not saying, listen, this whole book is scripture, but he's saying, I want to illustrate this by referring to a book that you, or a story that you have heard of. A third option is that Jude may endorse this as a prophecy of Enoch, and yet make no statement about endorsing the entire book of Enoch. You may simply say that this is one place where it really was Enoch and that this prophecy was of him. Which of these three is, is the best alternative for us? I'm convinced that Jude is really doing nothing more than citing a popular tradition or a story. And I'm convinced of that because of the fact that there are places where this happens in other parts of the New Testament. So, for example... Paul alludes to a rabbinic midrash on the rock in 1 Corinthians 10.4. There's a, a rabbinic midrash means a sort of commentary by the rabbis about what was going on. And in this case, the midrash says that there was a rock that followed them around in the wilderness. So Paul says they were all drinking from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. So here, Paul is that nowhere in the, in the Hebrew Bible do we see any sense in which the rock is following them around in the wilderness, but Paul cites this rabbinic midrash there. There are other places. One is in uh, 2 Timothy 3.8. There's a fascinating place there when Paul gives the 
names of the magicians in Pharaoh's court. Remember that there's this sort of clash of the titans, if you will. Moses and Aaron on one side, the magicians of Pharaoh on the other. And in the text of the Hebrew Bible, we don't know who the magicians were. There's no name for them. But Paul says, uh, the, <clears throat> just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, those are two of the uh, well-known or uh, well-populated uh, ideas about who the two magicians were. There were lots of people who speak about this. This comes from a book called Pseudo-Solomon, or in another place that it comes from is Pliny's Natural History. If you want to uh, know more about this particular issue with the names of the, of the uh, magicians, you can see uh, George Knight III's commentary on the pastoral epistles, and he has a complete bibliographic information there if you would like to know more about it. But it's, the, the point that I'm making is that Paul gets these names from somewhere, and they don't come from the text of the Hebrew Bible. And yet he feels comfortable in quoting those just as Jude does. He's not saying that they're canonical. He's just quoting something that it was a widely known at the time. And there are other examples. Uh, that the angels were the instruments who gave the law to Moses is not found in Scripture. For example, here is Hebrews 2.2. 2. For if the message spoken through the angels proved to be so firm that every violation or disobedience received its just penalty. Well, we don't learn anything about the angels speaking the law to Moses in the Hebrew Bible. But the writer to the Hebrews says that's what happened. In Hebrews 11.37, there's also an allusion to apocryphal material. Hebrews 11, remember, is this, this great hall of faith this great number of people who are, uh, have died or given their lives on the part of Jesus Christ or on the part of the gospel. And here the text says they were stoned, sawed apart, murdered with the sword. And it, 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 there's a, an apocryphal story about Isaiah uh, getting away from someone who wanted to kill him the king who wanted to kill him because of his prophecies, and eventually he was captured, put inside of a hollow log, and sawed in two. And we don't know that happened. Uh, we don't know that this is speaking about Isaiah because it doesn't mention Isaiah, but we know for a fact that <clears throat> this story was around at the time. And so this apocryphal material is appealed to on the part of this writer of the book of Jude. There are others that we can think about. Uh, Paul used pagan poets in a variety of different places. I'll, I'll show you a couple of them. And in using these pagan poets, he's not in any sense saying that they are inspired or that they're canonical, only that this is something that's well known. So, for example, in Acts 17, 28, he says, even as some of your own poets have said, <coughs> we too are his offspring. This Acts quotation is from Eratus, and it was probably from about 300 B.C. to 250 B.C., somewhere around in there. It apparently was well known because Paul is speaking at, on Mars Hill. He's speaking to a group of philosophers, and he says to them, your own poets have said this, so you should know it. In 1 Corinthians, he says, bad company corrupts good morals. This 1 Corinthians quotation is a quotation from a poet named Menander, and Paul uses this in a proverbial sense. He, it's true that bad company does corrupt good morals. And so we learn that, that all truth is God's truth, and that there, there's truth in pagan philosophers. Everything they say is not true, but God in his common grace often gives them the opportunity to <clears throat> know and to understand some things that are true. And that's what happened there. Here's one from Titus 1.12. One of their own prophets said, Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This is a, a, a saying that was attributed to 
Epimenides of Crete. He came from the island of Crete. And so to say, Cretans are always liars. Remember that that led to this logical issue. You might remember if you've ever taken logic to say, for a Cretan to say all Cretans are liars, we just ask the question, well, is he lying about that? Well, Paul is simply saying in this book of Titus that the prophets here that you well know about, <clears throat> they're saying something that's true. He's trying to use the culture of the day to show them that the gospel really is true. Given that, let's now turn to an overview of the book of Jude and look at what the book of Jude is really trying to say to us. Uh, one of the interesting things is that the book of Jude is, is sort of divided into sets of threes. There's the opening formula, <clears throat> which has this set of threes. But then there are some, there are some very specific uh, sort of illustrations or examples that Jude uses in terms of three. So in verses 5 through 10, Jude uses three examples of the punishment for disobedience. He, first of all, says those in the desert were punished for lack of faith. <clears throat> Remember that they wandered around for 40 years in the desert because they lacked the faith to think that they could take the promised land. The spies come back and say, the people are so gigantic in that land that we look like grasshoppers next to them. We can't ever take them. And because of the fact that they didn't believe God, they wandered around for 40 years and didn't take it until after that. Then... Jude mentions the angels. Those angels who lusted after women were locked in darkness. This is a very clear reference to Genesis 6 and to Enoch, 1 Enoch 10, 4 through 6, and chapters uh, 12 and 13. So it's very clear that there are a lot of questions about what Genesis 6 means, but it's clear that Jude believed that Genesis 6 was angels who came down and took women and they had these supernatural sort of children who were giants. Regardless of how you might think that that's weird and strange, it is. But that's what Jude tells us happened there. So those who want to argue that Genesis 6 is about something else have to contend with what the book of Jude says. And then Sodom and Gomorrah uh, practiced immorality. And as a result, they were punished by fire. And there's sort of a turnaround here that Jude is using. In the Genesis 6 story, angelic flesh, bad angels, lusts after human flesh, and they are punished for it. In Sodom and Gomorrah, remember that two angels come in, and, and they are, they're almost overtaken. They go into Lot's house. And all these men from Sodom and Gomorrah are going to tear the house down so that they can get at those angels. So in that case, you have human flesh lusting after angelic flesh. It's a sort of a turnaround of the same sort of problem. And Jude is saying here that whenever anyone does something which has been condemned by God, there are going, there's going to be punishment for it. Next, there are three more examples of description of ungodly behavior. He begins with Cain. Cain's evil had expanded in the later tradition beyond murder. Cain was obviously the first murderer. He murdered his brother. And in 1 John, John says, Not like Cain, who was of the evil one and brutally murdered his brother, and why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So in the Second Temple literature, uh, Cain's viciousness had been expanded beyond just being a murderer. Then there's Balaam. Balaam, you remember, is, uh, had a donkey who talked to him. And Bagan, uh, Baal, Balaam is not so negatively portrayed in the scripture. He's... he's He's negative, but he's not as negative as Philo and Josephus, who both portray him as very, very negative. And Jude here portrays him negatively. And then, of course, there's Korah. <clears throat> Korah, you remember, led a rebellion against God and Moses. And as a result of that, the earth opened up and the, swallowed those who were rebelling against God. Jude is saying to those readers of the book, listen, 
You're not going to go against God and get away with it. That will not happen. It didn't happen then, and it's not going to happen now. You have to realize that. So, then <clears throat> Jude goes on to talk about the prophecies of Enoch that we've looked at, prophecies of the apostles, about the coming of these ungodly people. Jude says you shouldn't be surprised that ungodly people have come in. And the uh, pr prophecy that says Jude says was made by the apostles, we don't have it in the New Testament. Or at least we, we, if we have it, we're not uh, exactly familiar with what Jude is drawing on. But he may be drawing on a wider Christian tradition about some other prophecies that the apostles made that we don't have written down. Different kinds of judgment are to be exercised on different kinds of people. Those who doubt or those who hesitate are to be shown mercy. We should never be happy about punishing someone or God punishing someone. We always want to give people an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to turn back, an opportunity to do the right thing. And those who are uh, falling, we want to we want to snatch them from the fire. That is, we want to show them that going the way they're going will lead to the same kind of punishment as Korah or Balaam or any of the rest of those. And so Jude is saying to that church, don't allow false teaching in there, but don't in any sense be happy or glad about the fact that you have to punish someone. Give them a chance while, while you contend earnestly for the faith, still give them a chance and perhaps they will be brought back to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The last two verses in Jude are a doxology. It's a wonderful doxology, a doxology that I am very, very fond of, a doxology that is used many times on many occasions and you can read that for yourself, but I'll leave you with just a couple of passages from Jude that I think will be helpful to you. This is from Jude 20 and 21. But you, beloved, he's saying, but you, beloved, you're not like those who are sneaking in. You're not like those who are trying to tear down the church. You, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, that leads to eternal life. So rather than tearing the church down, we want to build up, build ourselves up, not through our own strength, but through the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, Jude 24, this great benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And it is to him that we owe our salvation. It is to him that we are thankful. And it is to him today that we read this book of Jude, remembering what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope that you'll be with me next week as we end our study by looking at the book of Revelation. And I hope that the Lord will continue to bless you in your walk with Him this week. Thanks for watching Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Sunday School. And I hope that you have a wonderfully blessed week. Thanks so much.